And our first speaker is from the Clinical Excellence Commission. Dr. Karen Luxford is the Director of Patient-Based Care at the Clinical Excellence Commission. In 2010, Dr. Luxford founded the Partnering with Patients program at the Commission to promote patients, family and carers as care team members and the role of patient-based care in improving patient safety and quality in healthcare services. In 2008-2009, Dr. Luxford was a Harkness Fellow in Healthcare Policy and Practice, Harvard Medical School, Boston, and studied exemplar patient-focused organisations in the USA and the role of leadership in patient engagement and patient feedback in improving service quality. Dr. Luxford is an ISQUA expert for the International Society for Quality and Healthcare. Would you please join me in welcoming Karen? Thank you very much, Lee. So a little bit of a change of pace from the rest of uh, today, um, but you're ending with the most important bit, the patient. Um, so uh, thank you very much and I wanted to also acknowledge my co-presenter, uh, John Stubbs, who's been a colleague of many years and is now also a CC consumer advisor. So this is a bit of a tag team between us this afternoon. Um, so as Lee mentioned, uh, this area within the, the standards um, is a very important one. Um, it's one that's also pervasive throughout the standards when you're looking uh, at the various criteria. So um, certainly in the, the circles I move in, there's a lot of discussion about standard two um, in terms of partnering with consumers. But when you really have a look at the, um, the current throughout the, the whole of the, the uh, national standards, uh, it's very much about um, how we do that partnership piece and how we really work with the user of the service to get the best possible experience. Um, and this is where when you're starting to look at the work uh, around blood, uh, that there's also some important criteria that relate um, to that partnership. I wanted just to give a little bit of, of context um, because I think <coughs> where we're at at the moment, um, we often have patients uh, experiencing things being done to them um, rather than with them and rather than being in a, a partnership. And it's important to start to think about what, what are those essential components of partnership and they require a, a, a change in the dynamic between the people who are involved in, in that um, relationship. Um, one of the things that we've been looking at at CEC is trying to get um, a feel for uh, shift in attitudes by healthcare professionals, people working at the coalface about how they see the patient as a part of a team. And I was really encouraged in the first year of our work that we have slowly been seeing um, a shift in the views to how integral is the patient and the family as a member of that healthcare team. So we're making uh, some good but slow steps. And I think we'd be mistaken if we think that we can really tinker around the edges and look at models that in many ways are provider focused um, and think that they're really going to, to come up to the standard and come up to scratch. Um, it, engagement is, uh, is really a much bigger and integral step than thinking we can just slightly tweak uh, models that, that really focus around providers. And, with that in mind, we founded Partnering with Patients um, in the work of CEC, uh, often focused on the safety and quality aspects. But how do we actually get that true partnership? How do we really listen to the people uh, who are at the centre of that service and think about how we do things differently? So one of the areas I, I wanted to, to talk a bit about was around the issue of care planning, and this is something that's uh, mentioned in the, the criterion for the blood standard, is how you do that, that planning in partnership. Um, and what we see when we look at the international literature is often the things that um, healthcare professionals think are the expectations of patients and families indeed don't marry up with what it is that the patients are expecting 
um, and, and particularly what, what family and carers are also expecting out of a healthcare experience. So we need to acknowledge that there's a dissonance between those two sets of expectations. Uh, assume nothing, I think, is, is a good place to, to start from. And find out what those preferred outcomes actually are because they're, they're possibly different when you're doing care planning to the things that, that you as, as people involved in the healthcare system might think uh, they will be. Uh, and that involvement and engagement of the, the carers, um, the loved ones, the, the family members, um, a, as much as the patient wishes them to be. So how do you do that? How do you really get people as part of that, of that partnership? And then developing further the art of, of listening. And I know that's very hard in, in our busy world, um, but I, I think in everything that we've seen, it pays back many, many fold um, if we can actually just stop and think what it is uh, that the patients are, are telling us and what they're really trying to get out of a particular um, experience of, of care. We also need to consider that it's not one size fits all. Um, we, we talk about patients as, as though they were a, a amorphous group and we forget about um, the many differences. Uh, there's been some very good work done in Australia and internationally uh, around looking at the area of health literacy quite broadly and thinking about uh, how that impinges on um, people engaging with the healthcare system. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics did uh, did some research a number of years ago looking at the levels of health literacy in Australia and they found that 60% of Australians have low health literacy. So what does that mean? That means that they have difficulty in doing everyday health tasks and assimilating uh, everyday pieces of health information such as medication instructions. So really fundamental um, low levels of, of health literacy. And that parallels what we see internationally. So it's something that we need to, to be cognizant of and it's very much um, brought to the front in the national standards. So when you, when you look throughout the standards, there's uh, a stream of, of criteria that relate to providing meaningful and useful information um, to, to patients and, and families. And often when uh, people are provided information in a healthcare setting, they will get a little bit of that through in terms of, of understanding, but often not all of that information will, will, um, will be assimilated. How do you actually, yes, I can see the people who are giggling and very good at reading backwards. <laughs> um, th this is not dissimilar to what a piece of health information can look like to, to the average patient. Um, and there's a lot of good meaning uh, people who are developing patient information, um, but often it's, it's really not well understood. We do a lot of work in, in our uh, programs at the CEC with um, getting advice from our consumer advisors about what we should be developing and, and what that information should look like. Text-based, large text-based words, not a good idea. Um, graphic, simple, icon-driven, short pieces of information, lay language uh, are the things that, that really cut through. Um, we were lucky enough to have an expert from Harvard, um, Dr Rima Rudd, who did some work with us about a year ago around how do we break down those, those barriers um, because I think um, a lot of people put the onus on the user of the system. Oh, well, they have low health literacy. They don't understand us. If only we could raise that level of health literacy, then they'd know what we were saying. Um, we need to turn that on its head. We need to be thinking how do we really break down those barriers for, for patients to, to be understanding information and assimilating as, as it suits their their lives and the things that they're um, really focused on. And even when people think they're doing the right thing because they think they've understood the, the information that's been imparted, that can be interpreted in so many different ways. And I'm sure you all encounter that in the things that you're, you're doing working uh, around um, the precious resource of, of blood. 
There are many techniques that, that we can use to, to help our patients, to help our staff uh, in the way in which they explain information. Um, one of the techniques that we've taken from an educational setting uh, that some of you may know of is called Teach Back. Is anybody familiar with, with Teach Back as a technique? It's a, a quite a simple technique that um, recommends that uh, if you're a healthcare professional and you're imparting information, for example, about risk um, in this setting, I would have thought that's quite important, um, that you not only give that information as a one-way communication and then say, and do you understand? Because most patients will go, yes, I do. Nobody likes to look silly. Mm, I understood that. Um, teach back is, is a more approachable way of saying at the end of, of, of a discussion, a dialogue. So, Mrs Smith, we've talked about a lot of things today. We've talked about the, the risks of this transfusion, about this bone marrow transplant. Can you tell me what, what you think is important about the things that we've discussed and what you're going to take home and tell your family members about what we're planning to do with this, this procedure? Um, and then letting the patient actually convey that information back is a really powerful tool for picking up on what's been taken on board. Um, and it really will save you time in, in the end. And we can't just be thinking about information um, as written information. So when you're looking at uh, this criteria and the standards as, as it appears in, in many of the, the clinical standards, um, it's not just about the written pa patient brochure. Um, it's really much broader than that. It, you, you need to be thinking about um, verbal information that's conveyed, written information, wayfinding, signage, what your services look like, how approachable they are, how easy is it for people to navigate their way through that system. Um, we've been working on some uh, simple tools that are electronic to pull a lot of this information together around health literacy. Uh, we have a good partnership with the Australian Commission, which has been working on a, a discussion paper in this area. We've been focusing on some electronic tools. So we're going to release this on our website. It will be available for everyone to use. Um, and it will pull together some of those tips about um, creating meaningful and useful information for, for patients. So not using, you know, a reading age that's higher than a 12-year-old, making sure that there are minimal pieces of information um, included, uh, not using complicated jargon. Um, so some very basic uh, information and also links to some fantastic electronic tools that you can use when you're wanting to scan the information that you're preparing. I particularly like SMOG, the simple measure of gook. So if you want to just run a bit of information past some of these um, software packages, they'll tell you the reading age and, and uh, it'll help you to think about what you're preparing. Um, before handing over to, to John, I just wanted to touch on the area of in, informed consent. Um, there's quite a bit of good research around com informed consent. We have a number of experts here in Australia. Um, uh, Murray Bismarck, based at, in Melbourne, uh, is a health uh, lawyer who's done a lot of work in, in the field of informed consent. And I think it's very clear from, from the research that we need to be thinking about um, not just the written forms that, that are, are produced, which tend to have a lot of dense information on them that are hard for patients to, to, to actually penetrate, to, to get cut through in terms of what are risks and, and benefits of procedures. Uh, and it's not one size fits all, again. You know, we really have to be able to, to think about different people's needs and the information that they want. And that trusted relationship with a healthcare professional is a, a very important part of uh, that in being informed process. So I'm, I'm going to leave it there and hand over to John, um, who's also going to give some of his personal perspective. <coughs> 